Sometimes the most difficult part of an embedded project is just figuring out where to start. There can be many decisions that need to be made about whether to find or build libraries that handle, interfacing with your hardware, some kind of multitasking to manage that hardware, solutions for timekeeping and synchronization. You may need communication stacks for USB or network operations, a bootloader. You get the idea. These days, there are more open source options available than ever before, and if you're working with Rust, there's one project in particular that has a ton of community support and addresses all of these things in a modern, efficient async framework. Yep, today we're talking about Embassy. The Embassy Framework is a collection of crates that allows you to build energy-efficient, multitasking embedded applications. Once you've learned the basics of embedded Rust and a little about async, Embassy is often considered the best starting point for any non-trivial project, because it offers both the components you'll almost always need, which we'll cover today, along with more specialized libraries for things like protocol stacks or bootloader that we'll get to in future videos. The defining feature of all of these crates, and of the Embassy project itself, is their use of async Rust. Now, in a previous video, we explored async await by building a runtime from scratch. And while that kind of bottom-up approach can be very helpful in demystifying a challenging subject, it was a bit long. So what we're gonna do today is give a quick recap of how an async runtime works on a microcontroller, and then dive into the core embassy crates that allow you to build this type of system the easy way. And I find the best way to learn is by doing, so we'll again be applying this knowledge on a very simple project for the micro bit. Okay, it's time to revisit Async Rust. In a bare metal environment, Rust's async await feature can be seen as an alternative to using a real-time operating system for those that want to run multiple tasks concurrently. Instead of threads, you get async functions that encapsulate your application logic, and in place of a context-switching scheduler, you have a runtime consisting of an executor and a reactor. The code you write in each case may look similar on the surface, but the way these two systems work is much, much different. In the RTOS, each task has its own register context and stack, and it runs until control is cooperatively or preemptively yielded to a scheduler that can then switch to the next task by restoring its register values. An async runtime like Embassy doesn't do that. An async function gets transformed by the Rust compiler into an unnamed type that implements the future trait. This has a pull method containing a state machine version of your async function logic, where each await point gets its own state. Awaiting another async function corresponds to calling pull on it, which can then resolve to ready wrapping the output type if it completes, or return pending to the executor if it needs to wait for something. The executor can then run or pull the next queued async function, and the process repeats until all tasks are pending and the executor puts the core to sleep. And if the story ended there, it would be pretty boring, because after that first cycle, none of the tasks would ever run again. Except I neglected one key detail. If we rewind before the first task returned pending, it registers a waker callback with a reactor, which will often be a peripheral interrupt handler. Peripherals can continue to function while the processor sleeps, and so when those awaited for events come to pass, the interrupt handler executes the registered callback, which adds the task to the run queue and wakes the executor. So at the end of the day, you've got a single event loop within the executor, cooperatively running a bunch of state machine tasks. This means everything lives on one stack, so there's no stack size tuning to worry about, and you get some pretty great power efficiency right out of the box, because each task only runs when it needs to. Okay, let's see how the embassy crates map onto these async runtime components. First up is the embassy executor crate, and it gives you an executor, along with some tools you'll need to create the async tasks that the executor will run. The cooperative nature of an async runtime might lead you to believe that it can't support time-sensitive tasks, but in Embassy, it's possible to run multiple executors even in a single core system. You could have a normal thread mode executor running your lower priority tasks, then one or more interrupt-driven executors to run high priority tasks, allowing for some preemption. And for extremely time-critical operations, there's nothing stopping you from just manually writing your own interrupt handler. To add this crate to our project, we need to select the right feature flags for our application. 
This includes the core architecture of our microcontroller and the type or types of executors that will be used. So let's load up today's project in VS Code and add the Embassy Executor crate with features for the Microbits ARM Cortex-M controller, dformat for logging, and we'll use the normal thread mode executor. Your application logic will live primarily in tasks, and to create a task in Embassy, you apply the task macro onto an async function, which creates this feature within static memory along with some task metadata. The role of the traditional main function entry point is then to set up your executors, spawn your tasks onto the appropriate executor, and then start them up. If you're only using a thread mode executor like we are today, the easiest way to do all of this is to use the main macro on a main async function, which also provides a handle to spawn other tasks onto the executor. And just to be transparent, we can expand this macro and see that it gives us our async task, the main function entry point, and a thread mode executor that it starts running. Right now, our main task will load some log data into the RTT buffer and then never run again, which is not very interesting. To do anything worthwhile, we need access to our microcontroller's peripherals through an async API that will play nice with our executor. The Embassy hardware abstraction layer crates give us the other half of our async runtime a reactor driven from the microcontroller's peripherals that can wake tasks at the appropriate time. The Embassy framework maintains HALs for popular microcontroller families like STM32, Nordic's NRF controllers, and Raspberry Pi's RP2040. These crates offer both blocking and async APIs and implement the standard embedded traits. So even if you have a non-async project, you can still use these HALs. The implementation of the async APIs respect the standard waker interface, allowing other executors to use them as well. This also means that the embassy executor can work with a third-party HAL that has an async API, like Espressif's ESP HAL. In general, there's just a lot of flexibility with an embassy to pick and choose whatever crates suit your project's needs without having to buy into the whole ecosystem. But today we are going all embassy, so we'll need the embassy NRF crate for our microbits NRF52833. As far as the feature flags go, let's use dformat for logging, gpiote to do some async IO, and then bring in our controller. Like other HALs, a pack representation of the peripherals is contained within a singleton, provided in this case by the init function. The default configuration will set up the high and low speed clocks to their respective internal sources, which should be fine for what we're going to do today. Let's start by trying to detect when one of the microbits buttons is pressed. The left or A button can be represented as an input type. It's wired up to port zero pin 14 through an external pull-up resistor, so no internal pull is needed. The button is then active low when pressed, so we can just call the async wait for low function and await that. But we don't want to do this just once. To be a persistent task, we need a loop, so let's throw that in there. And to prevent an avalanche of messages, let's also wait for it to be released before trying to detect the next press. Okay, that should work, so let's try it out. Yep, that works, but there is some signal bounce that's causing more than one event to get logged for each press. What we need is a small delay to debounce the signal, and that's the responsibility of the next crate we'll discuss. Embassy's time crate acts as a timekeeper for your application, keeping track of the number of clock ticks that have elapsed since reset. It makes available instant and duration types that are similar to their standard library counterparts, and delay and timer types that can be used to create delays. Like the HALs, this crate implements both blocking and async embedded HAL traits, and can therefore be used in any embedded Rust project. For it to do its job, the time crate needs a time driver, which will use one of your microcontroller's hardware timers. These are offered by the Embassy HAL crates through optional feature flags, which for NRF is time driver RTC1, and will also need time. So let's get those added to the project. Last and definitely not least, let's add Embassy time itself, along with feature flags for D format and one that enables timestamps in the dformat logs. To take advantage of this, we'll need to update the display command we pass to probe RS. 
Okay, now we can use one of the timer types after methods to create a 200 millisecond delay to debounce the input. And send it. That's better. All right, we currently have one task monitoring the state of one button. If we wanted to add support for a second button, we would just add a second task, right? Let's start by going with our first instinct. The micro bits got two push buttons, so let's create two embassy tasks to support them. We can bring back the task macro we used earlier to create a button task and consolidate the input creation and debounce logic in here. Since this will be used for both buttons, we need to pass in the pin. This type can't be generic because it's being created in static memory, so we'll just use the any pin type and identify which button this is with a static lifetime stir. Task macro needs to provide storage space for two tasks, so we'll specify a pool size of two. Then back in main, we can use the spawner argument to spawn both of these tasks onto the executor with the necessary arguments for each button and allow the main task to just end. I'd like to point out that there are no allocations being performed here. Embassy doesn't use a heap and spawning a task just amounts to doing some internal bookkeeping within the executor's run queue and tasks metadata. This is a totally fine solution and as you can see here, it does the job. But it isn't the only solution. Earlier we learned that an async function is effectively just a constructor for an unnamed future type. And that future is our unit of concurrency, runnable by either awaiting it, which will return control back to the executor whenever it's pending, or by polling it manually, which allows us to collect the result and decide how to proceed. And that second option is where combinators like join and select come into the picture. Join will pull each unfinished future that it's given and only return ready once they've all completed. Select also pulls the provided futures, but will return ready as soon as the first one completes, dropping the others. Join and select are available as macros in the futures crate and also as functions within the embassy futures crate, which is what we'll be using today. So let's try that approach next. Instead of making separate tasks for each button, we can just grab a handle for those futures directly. These are no longer created as static, so we have a bit more flexibility with our arguments and could use generics if we wanted to. At the end of the main task, all we need to do now is join both futures. And update the log message to verify the change. Time to test. Still looks good. Okay, between tasks and future combinators, we have a few different ways to run operations concurrently, but how do we coordinate or share data between them? Synchronizing communication between tasks is the job of the embassy sync crate. It's got channels to exchange data between tasks, signals that can signal one or more tasks, a mutex allowing multiple tasks to share the same data, and more. This crate has a lot of useful types, so for today, let's just focus on one particular use case. We've got two button tasks, or futures, shouting into the void whenever a button is pressed. Let's turn that detection into action by signaling another task when these events happen, prompting it to change its behavior in some way. This kind of multiple producer, single consumer behavior really screams channel, but we don't need it to hold more than one item at a time, so let's try out signal instead. This requires a type implementing the raw mutex trait to synchronize access. Our tasks and futures are all in the same thread mode executor, so the thread mode raw mutex type should work. All right, let's get this crate into our project and start playing around. First up, we'll specify the type held by the signal with values identifying which button was pressed. Then we can create our signal in static memory with the thread mode raw mutex holding that button type. The futures will need to know what value to signal, so we'll need to update their call sites 
and the async function signature. And then make the call to signal the event when the button is pressed. Oops. This minimally needs to be clone, but copy is a good default behavior for a lightweight enum. Next, we need to create a new task to receive this signal. It could do something simple, like monitor the temperature, by using the HAL representation of the built-in temperature sensor. Then, each pass through its event loop could take a measurement using the async read method, converted from the default fixed point type into an integer so that this value can be printed in a log message in degrees Celsius. Before returning to the start of the loop, we need to add a delay to throttle the measurement rate. But at the same time, we'd like to wait for the button press signal, which could then increase or decrease that delay depending on the received value. This is the perfect use case for a select combinator. However, because one of these features is a delay, we can use a handy trait from embassy time called with timeout. This can be called on any future, and it effectively creates a timer from the given duration and runs the select for us. So first let's create the duration. Then wait for the signal, while also waiting for the timeout. We don't really care about the timeout, we just want to know if there's a new signal event, which we can then use to update the delay value. The A button could decrease the delay by some interval if it's greater than the interval value. Otherwise, just keep the delay as is. And the B button could increase the delay then finish up by logging the current value. Okay, back in main, we'll need to create the HAL temperature sensor from the pack peripheral. This requires us to bind the underlying pack interrupt symbol with the async HAL's interrupt handler function. This is pretty common when using the embassy HAL, and I think it's done this way to allow you to define your own interrupt handler when you're not using the async API. Lastly, we'll spawn the temp task onto the executor, and that should do it. Let's slow down the rate, then speed it back up. I guess we're still shouting into the void after all, but we did get to try out a new peripheral. I hope you enjoyed our tour of the embassy, crates, if you want to learn more, I highly recommend checking out the examples folder within the Embassy Project's GitHub repository. There is a lot in there, demonstrating how to use just about everything Embassy has to offer. That's it for today. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.